All right, so we continue in our series called Multiply, where we're learning how to, make, how to be disciples, who make disciples. The focus this week is the heart of the disciple maker, as we see on the screen. And so if you're focusing on the heart, very often then what you go to is what's the motivation? Why do you do what you do? So why would you then, for example, why would you make disciples? And um, <clears throat> there we go. And what's your motivation? And do you have any motivation? <clears throat> and when you look at the Bible from be beginning to end, there is this constant, uh, <clears throat> constant reminder to examine your heart and see what's driving you. Is life really mostly about you? We have days where we could probably say that. And maybe you're busy, you're involved in many things, but maybe going through the motions. Maybe you just have a bad attitude like this guy in the cartoon. Uh, is it coming? There it is. <clears throat> where he says to the preacher after the sermon, I'd like to see you love my neighbor. Anybody have a neighbor like that? Yeah, yeah. Some of you are that neighbor. I got, I got news for you, right? And so that's kind of funny. <clears throat> but from my own experience, both in myself and, and, and others, and more importantly, this is what we see in the Bible. It is the natural and easy inclination of our hearts to slide down into a cold cynicism that rationalizes and justifies our resistance to deeply love and engage with people. And this is one of the reasons why you see in the Gospels over and over, uh, Jesus goes to battle with the Pharisees because this is what was happening for them. And, and the religious leaders, he's just coming at them over and over. In one story, for example, Matthew 15, Jesus says, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. For me, and I would guess it's true for you as well, <clears throat> especially as we move into the colder weather, the pandemic makes it easier than ever to close doors and to make life about me and my little world. <clears throat> the parable of the Good Samaritan is intended to help stir our hearts and wake us up from our selfish slumber. So we're going to uh, read the story together. And um, Dan, if it, it would be helpful if that screen in the back could be synced with this one. <clears throat> All right, so let's read the story together. I hope you have your, uh, if it's on your phones or whatever, you can follow along. Here's the story, <clears throat> Luke 10, verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. <clears throat> now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Then he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he, then he set him on his own animal, 
brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So that ends the reading. Now the record here begins by explaining that this man is a law expert. And he approaches Jesus with the intent of testing or trapping Jesus. Many of the Jewish leaders at this time, they believed essentially that religion is a matter of good works and obeying the law. And what that meant then is that you were never quite sure if you were good enough as you stood before God as a judge. And so after you spent plenty of time at the end of your life working really hard, the scales could be weighed. And if you had more good deeds than bad deeds, if the scale was in your favor, you're good to go. You go to heaven. If you look a little better than a lot of other people, you're good to go. And then Jesus showed up. And he was always talking about entering the kingdom now. And so there was this suspicion that Jesus didn't really care about the law. Or at least he held it in a more of a low regard because he didn't teach obedience over time He didn't teach that obedience over time was the means to salvation. And so when the law expert asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Or what do I have to do to be saved? He's likely expecting Jesus to say something like, oh, just accept me as your savior. You don't have to obey the law or anything. And you're in. But Jesus wouldn't bite. And instead, Jesus turned it around as a trap for the lawyer. Jesus responded to the question as a rabbi in those days often did with another question. He said, what do you think? How do you read it? The law expert, verse 27, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, and okay, yep, I've got that, do this and you will live. Uh, No. Jesus said, yep, you've got it. Go ahead and do do that and you will live. And then verse 29, but he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, what does it mean that he wants to justify himself? Well, essentially, this is what he's saying. Just tell me what I'm doing well. Give me some assurance that I'm doing the right thing. In the book of Leviticus and elsewhere, the Hebrew word for neighbor, it encompassed a wide range of meanings. And so in some cases, it referred to anyone. In some cases, it referred to a coworker or a colleague. And in some cases, it referred to just close friends. And so the Pharisee law expert is looking for the easy answer from the rabbi Jesus And he's saying, in a sense, is my neighbor a close friend, or is it anyone, or who is it? Could maybe even Jesus push the limits further? And so, one way to think about it is that the man is looking for this. What is the minimum daily requirement so that I can go on with my nice, comfortable, orderly life? Now, will anyone honestly admit with me, that this crosses your mind from time to time? It does for me. Just give me the minimum. And so now Jesus' response here is to rock his boat by illustrating for him that he needs a new understanding of loving your neighbor. As we look at the story in some detail, we're going to answer three questions. And The first question is this, what does love for one's neighbor look like? And Jesus says, essentially, it's showing compassion to anyone in need. Now, this is one of the most significant we learned from this story. Jesus provided the details of how a Samaritan responded to the man in need, and he said very simply, go and do likewise. This is an, there is an example here that we are to imitate. That's what he's saying. 
So first of all, what does it mean for us to do likewise? Does it mean that we are to find a donkey, buy some oil and wine at Meyer, look for a needy person, and transport them to the local Holiday Inn and pay them with two silver coins? Do you think that could be it? Here's what we need to understand. Our call to mercy and compassion is a call to restoration and renewal. It's an intentional reversal of the effects of sin in the lives of those around us. And this is very much at the heart of our vision 2028, the corporate vision for our church family. But for anyone, for those of you who are listening online, wherever you are, this needs to be everyone's personal vision. That we would pray and act toward the coming of the kingdom of God. Heaven on earth. And we can see this intentional reversal in the story. So first of all, this is what happens with the robbers. They move toward him to wound. They stop, they strip him, rob and beat him, and then they leave him half dead. On the other hand now, the Samaritan moves toward him to heal cares for him with bandages, medicine, transportation, lodging, generous giving, and leaves him to be restored to health. Now, even as the man remains vulnerable, the Samaritan says he will come back to check on him. He will reward the innkeeper for providing the best of care. And the point that we see here is this, is that there are all kinds of people around us every day, even though we are isolated, there's still people around us from day to day where people's circumstances and sin work to wound, to strip, to rob, and to beat them nearly to death. Even by virtue of the New York Times article this morning, people are struggling, especially during the pandemic in this season of anxiety. And so we are called to move toward those who are in need to bring healing, care, and restoration. Sin and ugly circumstances, they are taking a toll on people just a few feet from you sometimes. Or at least six feet from you, right? You're coming into contact with friends, neighbors, coworkers, fellow students who have needs significant needs sometimes every day. And in the midst of the pandemic, these needs are far beyond what we could ever have imagined a year ago. And they're in this community. There are people who are beaten down because of their health, because they're feeling sick, or they're because of mounting bills, or because of chronic pain. People in and out of the church struggle with their family, with children, with marriage, with finances, with alcohol, substance abuse. There are refugees who need to learn English. There are all kinds of needs in our community. Every day there are dozens of wounds to be bandaged and healed all around us if we open ourselves up to them and pursue them. Now, if you look at verses 31 and 32, you see that the priest and the Levite, there is this key phrase, they pass by on the other side. Every day, I find ways to pass by on the other side. But notice something dramatically different in response to the Samaritan. There's some key phrases in 33 and 34. He came to where he was. He had compassion. He went to him. He took care of him. Our compassion must always involve action. And so, one way to summarize it is that we move to the other person to learn his or her needs. And then we care for the other person to meet those needs. And think about what kind of needs the Samaritan meets and provides for. There's physical needs, there's material needs, there's 
food, shelter, medical help, financial help, transportation. The Samaritan stays overnight so that the man has friendship, protection. This poor man is destitute, broke, and the Samaritan, Samaritan works to repair those things. And again now, to simplify it <clears throat> even more so that we can remember this because this comes up in our life all the time. The idea could be boiled down this way. You move toward and you learn needs. And you can do that <clears throat> by opening yourself up, not turning away from people, asking questions and listening. How many of you are question askers? Because that can be very helpful. And then we as well care for and meet needs. We move toward learn needs, care for, meet needs. So, that it, so there's follow-up action. You respond to the needs revealed. Now, one just very simple example, wasn't very intense in the last couple of weeks for Ruth and myself. We live in a condo community with just over 100 units in it, and we frequently walk just about every day through this community so that there are some people who have gotten to know us and Occasionally, we engage various neighbors along the way, and there's one elderly couple whom we have gotten to know a little over the last few years because they're out on their front lawn, and we go out and engage them. Sometimes I bump into them at Meyer, and or just we talk outside their house. And two weeks ago, as Ruth and I were walking toward John's house, he's about a quarter mile away from our house, John saw us coming, wasn't outside, saw us coming, and came out and stopped us, waved us down, and he says to me, Pastor, would you pray for me? He knew I was a pastor, and, and then he explained how he is engaged in a serious battle with cancer. And so I noted I would be glad to pray for him, add him to my prayer list, but I also said, let's pray right now. And then he explained, uh, and then he, what we, 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 we just stood on his driveway, and we just prayed together. And uh, it was a beautiful thing. And I continue to pray for him, and I will continue to follow up with him. I have another not-yet-believing neighbor right on our cul-de-sac on my who's deteriorating as well with his battle with cancer. And about a week ago, as he was working his way down the street with a walker, I stopped and asked how he was doing. And as we talked briefly, after we talked briefly, there was something he said that just really struck me. He says, thanks for stopping to ask. Now, I could list for you a thousand stories where I have failed miserably as I've gone through the neighborhood and as I've gone through life. But those are just a couple of examples where you can move toward, learn needs, care for, and meet needs. Simple examples. And again, I have more work to do with both of those men and others. In light of what we see here, each one of us should be asking ourselves this question. How am I personally and actively involved in a ministry of compassion for hurting people? And perhaps that's convicting for us, for a number of us here. But are you willing to act and to change? Now let's go back to the story to learn some of why we might struggle to follow Jesus' command and example here. Here's the next question. What gets in the way of our love for neighbor? Well, the second lesson that we learn here is that running and religion get in the way. Let me show you what I mean. There's a reason that Jesus chooses for his story a priest and a Levite who pass by on the other side. First of all, as the text says here, they were going down the road. It means that they were on their way home from their job in Jerusalem. So they don't have excuses that they're concerned about getting to work on time. Both the priest and the Levites were meticulous in their concern for obedience to the written laws of the Torah. 
particularly laws relating to ritual purity. And the text says that the man is left half dead. And so the meaning here then is that they could have thought he was dead. And if he is dead, if they touched him, they would become ritually unclean. And then they'd have to be horribly inconvenienced with this week-long purification process before they could report back to work. It's our version of quarantine today. Now, for these highly religious men, their religious ritual was much more valuable than a human life. Think about the times when Jesus challenged the religious leaders on topics like healing on the Sabbath, when he declared that it's always lawful to do good on the day of rest. In a similar way today, it's crazy for us, for us to allow our religious activities to keep us moving right past those who are in need. Sometimes doing church actually gets in the way of obeying Christ and showing his compassion to the world. We can be so involved with the activities of the church that we miss what he has for us in extending compassion. I suspect that many of us would admit that our lives <clears throat> often involve running at a rapid pace from one event, one activity to another. And the question that you have to ask when you look at God's word is, does God call us to busyness or does he call us to faithfulness? Several years ago, there was a study done at Princeton Seminary. They divided 40 students into different groups, gave them instructions to go quickly to another building on the campus to give a talk. And then on the way, in the alleyway that they would all have to go through, they staged a man who was slumped over, coughing, in trouble. It was five degrees, and he did not have enough clothing to stay warm. Half of the 40 seminarians, as they went to the other building, were also told to be prepared to tell the story of the Good Samaritan just to add a little more to it. Of the 40, only 16 offered help, and of those 16, they were mostly, the help was to go past the man and go tell someone else about the man. Only a few actually stopped to see if the man was okay. And the study found that it didn't matter what the circumstances or how spiritually mature they were, they nearly all failed, but there was one big factor and there was a direct correlation between those who were told that they were in the greatest hurry and those who did not offer any kind of help. And so religion and running clearly get in the way of demonstrating God's compassion to those in need. Mark Buchanan, in his book, The Rest of God, wrote this. He said, someone asked me recently, what was my biggest regret in life? I thought for a moment, surveying the vast and cluttered landscape of my blunders and losses, the evil I have done and the evil that's been done against me, and I said, being in a hurry. Pardon? And then this is what he said. Being in a hurry. Getting to the next thing without fully entering the thing in front of me. I cannot think of a single advantage I've ever gained from being in a hurry. But a thousand broken and missed things, tens of thousands, lie in the wake of all that rushing. Now, I confess that I struggle with the same thing. Some of you have golfed with me, you know. I like to keep moving to the next thing. I am with you in this. For many of us, and I know this is the case for me, there are a thousand broken and missed people who lie in the wake of our rushing. Here in West Michigan, think about this. We often tend to wear busyness like a badge of honor. 
When someone asks us how we're doing, we say, oh, I'm so busy. And, you know, really what that is, it's a boast disguised as a complaint, right? But perhaps we should consider this, that the COVID pandemic could actually be a cure for the much more spiritually dangerous pandemic of busyness that kills our love for God and our love for our community. And so we need to ask ourselves these questions. And, and in your small groups, ask yourselves these questions. How do you most often rationalize or justify the times when you pass by the other side? And maybe this, what do you need to cut out of your life in order to have margin in it to slow down and to show love? And maybe just think about one person this week. Who needs mercy? Who can you extend mercy to this week? And so now here's the last question that we're going to answer briefly. Who is our neighbor? And what Jesus is saying here, in a sense, is this. Even our enemy is our neighbor. Now, we need to be reminded, verse 29, that Jesus tells this parable in response to the question, who is my neighbor? Also remember that as the law expert asked this question, he's looking for the easy answer so that he could go on with his life unchanged. The truth is that we all have some preference for remaining unchanged. Even as we read and study the word. And now, here I am again, this morning, giving you more tension in your life. Here it is, right? Stone me, right? And I'm rocking your boat and changing things up for you. But here's why. The reason is that Jesus is a boat rocker and a foundation shaker. That's what he's doing here. And this is what he does with the law experts so that this religious leader could only conclude that even my enemy is my neighbor. Samaritans were repulsive, hated enemies of the Jewish religious leaders. And so when Jesus introduced the Samaritan as the one who showed mercy at the end, that was a shocking punchline. Samaritans, too, were concerned with ritual purity and would have been defiled by helping this man. And the Samaritan could easily have been implicated in the crime as he is bent down near the man. Nevertheless, the Samaritan has compassion. He loved the wounded man and he took action. Jesus asked the man, which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man? And the only conclusion left for the religious leader is the one who showed him mercy. So in order to understand who is to be your neighbor, you need to become a neighbor. The Samaritan became a neighbor and he has shown that even my enemy is my neighbor. Jesus had communicated this truth very directly a number of times where he said, I say to you, love your enemies. Matthew 5, verse 43, <clears throat> Jesus says, it's no big deal for you to love those who love you back. What's that? This is a great challenge. When God calls you to enter into the lives of those whom you might even despise, and show them the love and mercy of Christ. That might mean that Democrats could help Republicans, Republicans could help Democrats, right? In these times. It's crazy, right? You see, you are called to love those who make life very difficult for you. And you are to risk your comfort and sacrifice your time and resources for those who, in your mind, don't deserve it. 
So what happens here is that the law expert who worked to trap Jesus and turn him into an outsider who doesn't belong, Jesus turned it around to demonstrate that the religious man has nothing to stand on and he's now the outsider. And Jesus presented this inescapable truth to the law expert. And he still does this for us today. Love and care for those in need, even my enemies, it is not optional. It is not optional. And yet, I have little or none in my heart or life. So, what do we do with that? What do you do with that mess? Because here we sit in conflict. Here we sit in tension. Here we sit with Jesus rocking our boat because we know we struggle with this. So what do we do with that? Well, you have to understand that Jesus lovingly pierces our hearts with wounds and then heals through his word. Way back in 1741, there was a simple Connecticut farmer named Nathan Cole who after hearing George Whitfield preach in a field, he wrote these words, my hearing him preach gave me a heart wound. By God's blessing, my old foundation was broken up and I saw that my righteousness could not save me. So listen to that again. My hearing him preach gave me a heart wound. By, by God's blessing, my old foundation was broken up and I saw that my righteousness could not save me. And so this is what Jesus is essentially doing with this law expert. He says, you know, everybody deep down inside knows there's a God that's created them. And you know, therefore, you owe God everything. You owe him your highest allegiance, a great debt. And you also know there's no way to pay your own debt. And so then the law expert should be saying, like Nathan Cole, my righteousness cannot save me. What do I do? And Jesus would have turned around and he would have said, only by the mercy of God can you be saved. Because my friend, my dear fr lawyer friend, even though you're spiritually bankrupt, God in his mercy has sent me here to live a perfect life, to die a perfect death, so that when you believe in me, my spiritual riches can be transferred into your account. That's God's mercy for us. The law is fulfilled through me in your life. I will pay the penalty you owe. I will pay the debt you owe. I will be the person that you should be. I have it covered for you. And so believe in me and, and, and the law is fulfilled. I have a higher view of the law than you do. So you can only be saved by the mercy of God. The lawyer is trying to preserve his comfortable life built on the foundation of self-effort and self-righteousness. And Jesus is taking a jackhammer to tear away everything that he had been building his life on. And he does that with us. And through this story, Jesus showed the law expert that he is the one who doesn't take the law seriously. Look at what the law really requires and you will never be able to obey it. The lawyer has to abandon his whole old way of thinking and living. We don't know whether this law expert could humbly receive the gift. We don't know what happens at the end. But for those of us here, for those of us listening online, what really matters is whether you are receiving this gift of God's mercy through his son. One of the great rewards of my work as a pastor is that I can be a part of making a difference 
be a part of the change that God is working. And in the same way, you can make a difference in this world with your neighbors, friends, and coworkers, but only by loving and caring in a way that Jesus loves and cares for you. If you think about it, you don't change and shake up the world by loving and hanging out with people who are just like you. Think about this. People are unmoved by a love that is shallow and convenient. It's meaningless. Anybody can do that. What changes the world is Christ's love revealed in our actions, a love that is deep, a love that's willing to suffer, a love that involves sacrifice and expense. Now you have the opportunity to demonstrate to others the same love that Jesus is showing to you. You will care for the poor only when you recognize that you are poor and bankrupt apart from Jesus. And here's what we have to remember every day. You were once found on the side of the road and there was no sign of life. And you were a repulsive mess with the stench of sin. Nevertheless, Jesus Christ had compassion on you. He saw your need. He moved toward you. He cleaned you up. He provided healing for your deepest shame and guilt. And now he's giving you everything you need for an eternal life of joy. Amen? That's him for us. Jesus was stripped, beaten, and brought to death so that he could rise up to care for you, heal your wounds, and restore you to a new life. And so, can you give up your pride in your self-righteousness? Can you give up your desire to just keep things unchanged? The more you hold out your hand to receive mercy and forgiveness from Jesus, <clears throat> the more you will extend your hand to give mercy to others. That's what we have to remember. And that's why you go to his word every day. And that's why we're here again today to receive his mercy, to receive his forgiveness so that we can indeed be empowered and enabled, motivated to give mercy to others. You will have a story to tell. You have riches to share. So going back to that Mr. Rogers classic line, won't you be my neighbor, right? Won't you be a neighbor? Let us be neighbors who daily receive mercy from God so that we will perpetually show mercy from God. Then we have the love to be disciple makers. Let's pray together. Holy Father, you are amazing in that not only do you show us the way through your word, but you provided the way. We don't have to survive or thrive in relationship to you with our good efforts because they are worthless. We can't do it. We are grateful that Jesus lived the perfect life that we could not, that he suffered under the guilt of our sin. He paid the debt that we could not so that we are indeed able to stand up as adopted sons and daughters, as those who have been rescued, to be rescuers, to extend mercy. We thank you. We praise you. Receive our worship as we sing now in Jesus' name. Amen.